Liftoff of Atlantis and a six-man crew on a Department of Defense flight. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours and holding. All is going well in our countdown. And we've got the flight crew for STS-44 having breakfast in the crew quarters at the operations and checkout building. Crew is just beginning their first flight day of a 10-day mission. We've got mission specialist Jim Voss flying for the first time. Payload specialist Tom Hennon. Mario Runco flying for the first time today. He's a mission specialist. And we've got Commander Fred Gregory making his third trip into space today. There's pilot Tom Hendricks. He's flying for the first time today in space. And mission specialist Story Musgrave. He becomes a four-time shuttle veteran today. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours and holding. We've got uh, Commander Fred Gregory, Colonel in the United States Air Force, being assisted. He's getting his helmet on. And uh, this is in the suit-up room at the operations and checkout building. Commander Gregory was just briefed on the weather conditions here at Kennedy and uh, essentially uh, world, world weather conditions in case they had to make a landing at a Transoceanic abort site. We've got uh, mission specialist James Voss. He's uh, being assisted with uh, getting things stuffed into his pockets. We've got mission specialist Mario Runco. He's flying for the first time today. Mario is a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. Payload specialist Tom Hennon standing up. Hennon is a chief warrant officer in the United States Army. He's a payload specialist on this, this flight. He'll be conducting the Terra Scout experiment for this mission, making observations of uh, various sites on the ground from space. We've got pilot Tom Hendricks flying for the first time today. He's got on uh, his watch pointing to it. He's a colonel in the United States Air Force. Crew does a, a brief test of the suit. They uh, have wear, uh, air circulated through the suit, and it just tests for a leakage rate in the suit. While they're in the suit-up room, we've got uh, here mission specialist Story Musgrave. He's a medical doctor. Uh, Story is becoming a four-time shuttle veteran today. This is shuttle launch control. We've got the STS-44 flight crew coming down the hall at the operations and checkout building. Commander Fred Gregory is leading the group. Pilot Tom Hendricks. We're all waving goodbye to well-wishers at the ONC building. And we've got the crew coming out. A group of uh, well wishers. Crews all ready to go. Fly today. MCD launch director T12. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think. We've about converged on the, uh, the calculations for the replenish time, so uh, you ought to have the team prepared to come out of this hold at 35 past the hour, 
looking for a T0 at 45 past the hour. I'm sorry, 44 past the hour. I understand. Thank you. T minus 2 minutes 30 seconds. The orbiter test conductor has requested that Pilot Henricks clear the caution and warning memory system. Retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood is now underway. Liquid oxygen tank is now at flight pressure. T minus two minutes and counting. Tonight's launch will mark the seventh night launch in the history of the shuttle program and the tenth flight of the orbiter Atlantis. And enjoy your Thanksgiving. Okay, let's go for EP LH2 pressure. Atlantis is ready. T minus 31 seconds. We have a go for auto sequence start. Atlantis's four redundant computers have primary control of critical functions. 20. Fifteen. T minus 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have a go for engine start. Six, five, four, three. Two, one, liftoff of Atlantis and the six-man crew on a Department of Defense flight. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling Atlantis is completely rolling over to the proper position for its climb to a 28.5 degree inclination orbit. Three main engines now throttling back to 70% as Atlantis prepares to pass through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Atlantis speed is now 1,000 miles an hour, altitude 34,000 feet downrange from Kennedy Space Center, four nautical miles. Atlantis, Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Three engines now back, operating at 104% of rated capacity. Good hydraulic systems, good electrical systems. Atlantis Houston, com check, UHF only. Loud and clear, John. You're loud and clear also. Altitude now 127,000 feet. Atlantis speed 2,725 miles an hour. Downrange from Kennedy Space Center, 25 nautical miles. Good SRB, sir. Roger. Good Nikos. Three engines continuing to operate well at 104% of rated capacity. Good hydraulic systems, good electrical systems. Altitude now 198,000 feet. Velocity 3,068 miles an hour. Two engine band jewel. Roger, and performance nominal. Nominal. Those calls indicate Atlantis's performance so far has been as planned, and that Atlantis could now perform a transatlantic landing at Banjul the Gambia on only two engines if one were to fail. However, that, however, all three engines continuing to operate well at 104 percent. Atlantis 
altitude is 286,000 feet. Velocity now 4,200 miles an hour. Downrange from Kennedy Space Center, 102 nautical miles. Atlantis, negative return. Roger, negative. That call indicates Atlantis can no longer return to the Kennedy Space Center for landing if that were to become necessary. However, all three engines still operating at 104%. Good hydraulic systems, good electrical systems.
And just below that, there are a cluster of three and then one other round object, dark round objects that you can see. Those are other sensors. The larger white circles to the left and to the lower part are antennas that are used for uh, communicating with the satellite. before we pull the umbilical at 29 degrees is where we stop, and then we'll go ahead and raise it on up to 58 degrees, which is the final elevation. We need to get it up to about 45 degrees or so to ensure that we're going to have clearance when the payload uh, is separated from the shuttle. It separates, and then it goes right up over the top of the crew compartment. So we've got to have a pretty good angle so that we, we don't run into the structure. satellite with all the silver and the gold on it. Story was really excited about it. He thinks he's got some great pictures of, of the whole de uh, deploy sequence with both the Aeroflex and with uh, Hasselblad. We did. get it up elevated like this, we do another survey of the payload to make sure that we don't see anything that could be wrong. At the same time, time the ground controllers at Sunnyvale are checking out everything and making sure that the inertial upper stage, which is the booster, uh, is in good shape and the defense support program satellite folks are making sure that their satellite is working correctly. The inertial upper stage, once we deploy it, uh, one hour after we've kicked it out, it ignites its solid rocket motor, and it, uh, it pushes it on out into orbit. And this is after we got into the dark. Uh, unfortunately, it was a dark deploy, so we weren't able to get good uh, shots of it too long. We could only use the payload bay light to be able to see it. Uh, so once it goes a little bit away from the orbiter, it no longer has any lighting, and we won't be able to see very much of it. But you'll see it deploy here in just a minute. When it deploys, there's something called a super zip. It's a, a charge that separates the inertial upper stage from the airborne support equipment and it cuts it very cleanly. The payload has been pushed out away from the orbiter, and after one minute, uh, Fred moves the orbiter away from the payload. And then a little bit later, we do an ohms burn, which we'll show you, an orbital maneuvering system burn. There's the deploy right now. You can see it drifts away very slowly and gracefully. It cleared all the, the uh, support equipment very nicely. really a very nice satellite. The deployment system worked real well. You can see the inertial upper stage at the bottom with the USAF. I don't know what that stands for, but uh, <laughs> something. And then the gold nozzle down below it, which is the uh, solid rocket motor that will boost it up, the first stage of the solid rocket motor that will boost it up to its final geosynchronous orbit, about 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. Once it's up there in its final orbit, it'll be uh, put where our government wants it to be, and it'll look down and watch for missile launches and continue to protect our nation.
and now you can barely see the satellite in there. Once it gets out of our lights, it's very difficult to see. I hope you can see it almost in the middle of the screen as it moves away from us. And the farther it got away from us, the more difficult it was to see. And off to the right is the moon, which is much easier to see. Now we're going to show you a little bit of what we can see with our, our uh, CCTV system. Okay, now you'll see a flash as the ohms, the orbital maneuvering system engines ignite. That was the ignition, and now you can see a little glow just on the top of the ohms pods. That's the burning ohms engines. You'll we'll see a little uh, RCS jet fire on the right side of your screen when the burn is over. There it was, and that was the completion of our burn. Well, can you still see it? Look at the garbage on the... See it from the overhead window. Yeah. Too far away. What do you mean? It's only six miles. <laughs> How about on the veil? Yeah. Not a couple miles. It was a little bit far away to get real good uh, pictures of it, but it, it certainly showed up well with the sun coming up on it like that. We're looking down at the Earth's surface. We, our own burn brought us up above it, so we were looking down at the IUS DSP as it flew underneath us getting ready for its burn to put it into its higher orbit. Just let me in the race, so I'm going to do it. Okay. I'm ready to give you a count. Go. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Three, two, one. Disengage. There it goes. We've got it. Space, the final frontier. This is the voyage of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Its 10-day mission to explore new methods of remote sensing and observation of the planet Earth. To seek out new data on radiation in space and a new understanding of the effects of microgravity on the human body. To boldly go where 255 men and women have gone before. Hello, Fred, Tom, Story, Jim, Tom, and especially Mario. This is Patrick Stewart, choosing not to outrank you as Captain Jean-Luc Picard, saying that we are confident of a productive and a successful mission. Make it so. Good morning, Atlantis. Most of you will recognize this as DSO 611, the microbial air sampler. And all we do is uh, put a strip that looks like water paper in it and turn the fan on. And for three minutes, it takes an air sample. We have it on the mid deck, and here it is taking a sample on the uh, flight deck. Okay. Got a good shot. Okay, you can see an, an island there in the barrier reef uh, near Australia, and Tom is tracking that on the screen right now as we fly over. We've got it. Our uh, antenna 
antenna that mounts in the window for M88-1. Uh, this is our UHF direct comm antenna. This essentially is the computer brain for our charge couple device or CCD camera. Uh, the camera, which you see over here, I'll bring it into view, has basically an RS-232 type uh, port on it that takes the signal from the CCD back, and this is just a Nikon F3 camera. Uh, the F3 camera has been modified a little bit. The film back has been taken off, and the CCD device has been put on. And the electronics uh, part of the CCD is down below here. And the CCD camera uh, then outputs its signal uh, through the RS-232 cable to the tethered electronics module. The tethered electronics module has a disk drive in it. Essentially, it records the digital image from the CCD on a disk. The disk then can be accessed and displayed on the uh, black and white uh, high-density monitor that I have mounted next to the temp. Okay, Jan, as you can see, I've got the camera all uh, hooked up together. The lens is on the camera. And uh, the lens essentially mounts up to be a uh, about a thousand millimeter uh, uh, telephoto lens. Uh, there are the, the basic lens is a 300 millimeter, and the there are two doublers on it. Essentially, it's a 1.4 and a 2. So, in any combination, I can go up from 300 millimeter to about uh, 450, or to about uh, 600, and then up to a thousand if you if you do the multiplication uh, out in detail for that. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see things on the ground uh, with the camera and displayed on, on the monitor uh, to uh, the greatest detail we've been able to get to, to date. We also have uh, associated with M88-1 uh, some radios at direct comm. I showed you the antenna earlier. I'll go back to that and talk a little bit about the uh, radios that we have. You can see I have them mounted up essentially uh, neatly stacked under the monitors underneath the TEM with Velcro. I have the uh, the radio itself, and then below that, the uh, crypto gear for the radio. Uh, the radio essentially is a, is a standard military issue uh, UHF radio. Uh, it's an LSP-5B and a KY-57 uh, uh, set unit, and these can be used uh, in the field uh, basically by the Army and the Marines, but we have it on board to, to talk direct down to a, a person on the ground that will be located on site uh, for an individual target. Uh, and he'll be passing to us weather and conditions at the target. Uh, for example, if we're going by a port facility, he might uh, tell us uh, what ships are in port or what ships are moving in and out of port, uh, uh, information like that. And then uh, armed with that information, I can then try and look for those on the ground. And Dan, what we're watching now is Fred putting story into the LBMT. They're zipping up the waste seal right now. We have to have a real good tight seal so that when we lower the pressure in the bag, we don't pull any air inside. Yeah, Fred's been putting on the uh, these little leads here to get the electrocardiogram and also get the heart rate. And also, the heart here triggers when the blood pressure sensor here on my arm, uh, when that looks for different sounds. You put a blood pressure cuff on the arm like this, you pump up that blood pressure cuff higher than the blood pressure that's in the artery, and that stops the blood from flowing down here. As soon as you decrease the pressure in the cuff enough where the blood can flow through, this little accelerometer here, like the doctor's stethoscope listening, uh, picks up those pulses coming through. And that goes into a blood pressure measuring device down here, which then records the pressure. And Jan, what you're watching now is Tom's updating our Spock, uh, our PGSE. He, uh, we didn't think that it was synced up very well with our state vector, so he's putting a new state vector in to make sure we're all synced up with it. Okay, we see that. And you can see Mario, he's got two Hasselblads mounted on our dual mount there. He's going to be taking some pictures. What he's got in there right now is, is color 
color positive and color IR as part of a test to look at the difference in the two. And we'll be taking some shots of, I think, over the ocean. doing a visual function test. That's the pilot, Tom Hendricks, on the left. On the right, payload specialist, Tom Hennon. He is looking in what's called the VFD, the visual function tester, which we will give you a look at sometime, too. Particularly on this mission, vision from space is a very important thing, and there are reasons to think that maybe vision changes. You've all seen the puffy head that we have on board, the head is puffy. Also, you can expect the eyes to be a little larger. We do measure changes in the eyeball pressure in space, but there is a good reason to think that maybe the eyeballs change size. And if they change size, just like a camera, the focal length of a camera, vision would change. Now here, your cinematographer, Jim Boss, is doing a great job with this show, is giving you one example of what you see in the visual function. I'm simulating here what the crewman's activities are, and that is to take a cassette tape. I load a cassette tape in for each one of the test uh, sequences. I push the power button and start it to running, and after sequences, I'll then change out the tape. The importance of bioreactor is it has three different size spheres, and once we get it tested out and do the kinds of development and tweaking we need to on terms of RPMs and densities and like, we will be able to grow tissue cultures in space, not just single layer tissue cultures. Right now, if you grow tissues on, on in Earth in 1G, you only get a single layer of cells. It is not very effective or efficient way. Once we perfect this system, we will be able to grow clumps of tissue cultures. And you may ask why tissue cultures are important. It's very important to be able to understand cancer cells. You need to grow them, such as a farm, and then you can study them. Also, many vaccines are grown in tissue cultures. And Jim Boss here is focusing the camcorder in, and that's, and you can see three different size spheres in there, red, white, and blue, as they traverse this is one particular sequence. Now, they will take up many, many different motions, and once we've perfected being able to hold and minimize the shear stresses across these spheres, we will then be able to put living cultures in there, and hopefully we will be able to use the zero-gravity environment, the space environment, to enhance our ability of biological tissues uh, growing outside of the body. And that's the completion of our bioreactor. The last thing we have for bioreactors, we'd like you to push and hold the reset button. That should stop the drum and allow us to see the deceleration of the bead. Okay. Pat, do you want me to hold it or just push it? You need to hold it in in order to keep the drum stopped. Okay, I'll get my adapter to do that. to the right of the galley are our lockers and 
Tom Hennon, who's helping out here, is going to show you what's inside one of our food lockers. They're stowed by each meal. It's meal A, B, and C. That's like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And all of the meals for the six of us are stowed inside there. This is a couple of meals worth. Different kinds of containers. We'll show you those later with some plastic bags to put our garbage in when we're done. And then even different types of containers. And underneath, look at all that stuff inside that tray. It's a lot of food stowed into a very small space. And once we get it out to take a look at it, it's also very difficult for us to get it all back in to the locker, so we have to eat a lot. Tom managed to get all of that closed back up and locked the locker back up again. Moving on, we're going to show you what's in one more of the lockers, just so you get a feel for some of the things that are stowed in there. And this one is some of our photographic equipment. We have an Aeroflex camera in the front, and then in the back is some of our 30 mil 35 millimeter camera equipment. And what we are showing now is some of the film. It's all stored in there nice and neatly so we can keep track of it, uh, find our film when we need to replace those that we've used. Books are a problem also. Uh, up on the top, you see an exercise protocol. Many of our procedure books that we have stowed away, they each have their place, and we return them there when we're done with them so that we can find them. Over on the wall are our sleeping bags. They stay stowed on the walls until at night. Some of us sleep tied to the wall like the bags are. Others just get in their bags and float around. We found a convenient place to store our running shoes that we use for the treadmill. They fit very nicely in the airlock door, and they stay there very well. So once you get into space, you find all the convenient places to store things, and we uh, use the Velcro that's available and put up some of our own when we find a spot that we really need something. Tom's now opening up, opening up one of our personal hygiene kits. It has our razors and shampoo and soap, uh, all the things that you normally keep in your bathroom. We keep them in a little box like this or another means that I'll show you later. This is a different way of keeping your personal hygiene items together. It's on a long belt that has Velcro on the back of it so you can Velcro it to the wall where you're working uh, when you're cleaning up, and all the items go into elastic on them works fairly well. It doesn't contain them quite as readily as the uh, other type, but it puts it all out easily available for you to use, uh, and you can see it a little bit better. It's just personal choice which one you want to use. This is a very large bag that we have inside the airlock. It's a soft bag, <coughs> and inside it are uh, about 10 smaller bags, 10 or 12 smaller bags, and each of the bags are color-coded, so you know which is yours. There's mine. It's got blue on it. That's my color. And inside this bag, I have uh, all of my extra underwear and, and T-shirts and uh, a couple of other kinds of shirts. I'll uh, look and see what one of them is. <laughs> oh, that's right. This is an Army production. I forgot. I'm going to show you some of the stowage in our waste control compartment, our bathroom. Back over here, you see some of the container, the uh, places on the side there, the little black things. Those are where we store our washcloths and towels. They're rubber, and they have a slot in them. You push the washcloth in them, and they stay in very well to dry out before you put them in the dirty clothes. We also have several cabinets in the back that we stow a lot of our equipment that we use for personal hygiene. Here you see our containers for our urinals. We have one of those for each of us. Uh, washcloths are stowed in here. I'll show you how we put one of those up on the wall. This goes right in very nicely, and it stays put. We do, they're all color-coded so that we can keep our own washcloths separate from the others. Here's a towel compartment. And over on the other side where we put our wet trash. Uh, after we've used the bathroom, sometimes we have uh, moist items that need special stowage, so we put them in a bag there. Here are some of our dry wipes, our toilet paper. And once they're used, they go in this can, which we then close up at the top and we put into our wet waste container. It has a continual airflow through it so that the odors are contained there. Tom's going to show you some of the things that we have to contend with when we use up some of our articles in space and get rid of them. We find it easier to put a little plastic bag on the front with some Velcro and fill it up with our trash as we go by so we don't have to open it all the time. Uh, so we just put things in there, keep it sealed up like this. We'll have a piece of dry uh, piece of paper that he wants to put away. Uh, we'll put it inside.
inside the plastic bag because it's very convenient just to go by and stick it in there. Once it's full, we open up the trash compactor. It has an easy access door. It normally is very easy to open. Uh, the compactor is getting a little bit full and it was jamming it a little bit there. And then there's a, an easy access uh, front. It's kind of a diaphragm that has slots in it. And you can just push your food into there so you don't have to pull a door off and, and put it back on. So you just push the waste into it. And we can continue to push stuff in there quite some time until the trash compactor is filled up. It's closes up the door and he locks it shut. We have all of the waste that we had from our meals for a full day for six of us, plus I think a little bit from this morning that we had. So we have quite a bit of trash inside there now. And we could have put a lot more in there, but just so we could demonstrate it for you, we uh, decided to go ahead and compact it for you. Tom's showing you how easily the handles can come off and go back on. And then he's going to compact it for us. He adjusts the handle so that they will now be in the compaction mode. And he's going to start cranking away on it. It takes about 60 uh, motions of the handles in order to fully compress the garbage that's inside there. Trying to back off and give you a little bit better view of how Tom has to brace himself to secure himself in place while he's compacting. Yeah, he has to back off just a little bit. He had so much pressure on it, he couldn't get the door open. So he backed off a little, relieved the pressure. Now he can pull the bag out. It's all squished down, has that full day's worth of six people's garbage in there. Pulls these straps out that then will hold the plastic bag in and not let it expand back out to its former shape. So he pulls the whole thing out, and there's all of our trash for an entire day plus some more. Now let me show you the flight deck. We also have to store a lot of things up here. You can see all the books and papers. That's our morning mail up there on the front in front of Fred's seat. All of our procedural books, maps, the PGSC, our good computer up there stowed between the windows. Tom's got the good photograph of his three children up there right above his seat. Some more messages that we got from the ground. And we have our tape for our VTR over on the wall. Now, we stow things just about any place that we can on the walls, on the floor, on the ceiling. This is where the Terra Scout equipment goes, all the extra binoculars and other equipment that Tom uses for his observations. More messages from the ground. More flight data file. This is where we store Story. We put him up in a window with a couple of Hasselblads in his hand, and he's very happy up there.
if for some reason we use Need Hump Step Bravo again. Uh, we've just completed uh, page W-56 in the IFM procedure, and that's what you're seeing, the, the, the finish up on that. Okay, copy, Fred. Driftwood, Driftwood, Driftwood. This is Atlantis. Atlantis. Over. Atlantis, Atlantis, Atlantis. This is Driftwood, Driftwood, Driftwood. Refer to your site pan, site data. I'm with you in the mile book 8-5, uh, 8.1 Bravo, when you're ready on the IMU. Fred, that is not required. Uh, we're still pulling the data to uh, determine exactly what the problem is with the IMU. We don't need you to uh, run the malfunction procedure. Okay, I think everything on here is checked with MCC anyway. Roger that. Atlantis Houston for Fred. Go ahead. Fred, we want to have ideas on the IMU too. We see problems both with the attitude and the velocity. We have declared IMU two failed. We want you to leave it powered on for now, and we're still discussing the implications of that failure. And uh, we'll get back with you when we uh, we have a plan. We're at a mission elapsed time of uh, five days, 16 hours, and 41 minutes. Uh, CAPCOM uh, Jan Davis has just informed the crew that inertial measurement unit two uh, is failed. Uh, the flight control team is still in the process of uh, discussing and uh, analyzing any impacts they may that may have. Flight GNC. Given this uh, FPC two and three traces that you gave me up here for you and Eagle, um, are you sure you want to leave this guy powered on? Well, Flight, that's, um, that's a good question to ask. We've been talking to Eagle folks. The uh, comforting data from that is that the uh, IMU is not pulling any more current uh, than it did prior to the failure and no more than we would expect uh, from nominal operation. So we don't believe it's an internal short uh, in the box or anything that would cause sparking or anything else. If that were the case, then I agree we'd absolutely go uh, go and turn it off. Eagle flight. Flight Eagle. At this Can point, you go with that plan? Yeah, at this point, uh, I'm not real concerned. We're still looking into it. Uh, I didn't see anything in those traces that really gave me any heartache. Um, it looked like a power shift, something internal to the, the unit. I didn't see anything that indicated a short uh, or anything that would... Uh, make me uncomfortable at this time. IMU 1 and 3 are working and uh, their performance throughout the mission has been outstanding. Atlantis Houston for Fred. Go ahead. Fred, we've been... Houston, go ahead. Fred, we've been uh, consulting with the management team. We're all at a consensus that we are declaring an MDF due to the failure of the IMU. We also require a lake bed landing. The first entry opportunity we'll have is for tomorrow 
We're looking at the weather at Edwards now to see if uh, we can, in fact, do that tomorrow. Houston, Atlanta, does the uh, data feel, it, it, does the data look okay? Stand by. Atlanta, Houston, the data looks good. This is Mission Control of Houston. This view of uh, what's left of the eye of the storm of Typhoon Uri. Uh, Typhoon Uri has officially been classified, down classified now to an extra tropical storm. It's still got winds from uh, 80 miles per hour gusting up to 105 at one point earlier in the flight. Uh, it had a very well defined eye uh, stretching 15 to 20 miles across and uh, winds uh, up to from 150 to 180 miles per hour. Atlantis Houston, you've got a go for the deorbit burn. We'll have a final runway selection between four or five for you shortly, and your go to maneuver to uh, deorbit burn attitude on time. Okay, sir. Flight Fido, go ahead. Convoy's in position and ready to support. Okay. Flight Chiefs, go ahead. We'll have AOS by then, but the EI minus 20 secondary actuator check will not be required. All right. Essentially 09011. Uh, yeah. 11. 11 got Okay. Right. And his energy's nominal now. Fly? I did. See him good on the. Okay. Atlantis Houston, we see you uh, on energy approaching the hack. Surface winds are now 0, 09 or 0 at uh, 11 gusts to 13. Roger. That call indicates that Atlantis speed is uh, perfectly normal as it uh, begins a right overhead turn around the heading alignment cylinder to align with runway 05. This view shows Atlantis uh, with wings angled uh, in a bank to the right at 42 degrees. 
altitude 48,000 feet. Atlantis airspeed now 207 knots, range to touchdown 23 nautical miles. Guidance, Navigation, and Control Officer reports Commander Fred Gregory has now taken uh, manual control of Atlantis. Atlantis, Houston, on energy at the 270. <coughs> that call indicates uh, Atlantis speed remains looking very good uh, as it has 270 degrees left to go in its right turn to align with runway 05. Altitude now 31,000 feet, airspeed 263 knots, range to touchdown 16 nautical miles. Atlantis Houston, slightly low at the 180. Okay, I'll take that. Atlantis Houston, disregard the brake pressure message. Crew told to disregard a message about uh, brake pressure as a false message. Altitude now 7,100 feet, four miles to touchdown, airspeed 290 knots. Atlantis aligning uh, with the center of runway 05. Altitude 3,000 feet. Gear down. Main gear touchdown. Atlantis uh, will roll out uh, without braking uh, due to a test objective. Roger that, Atlantis. We concur. Okay, this is 15 knots, but not some breaks. The wheels stop, Houston. Roger, wheels stop. Good job, Fred. Welcome home, Atlantis, and congratulations on a great flight. <laughs> 